Welcome to another episode of Business with Passion. Each show features guests who have transformed their long-term passion into a successful business. I'm your host, Jay Hamilton Roth. My marketing strategy business grew from my love of talking with passionate business owners. In this series, I share their passions with you. So if you're looking for inspiration to enhance your business passion, keep watching. My long-term passion is to rehabilitate the earth, to uh, mitigate the destruction that we've wrought in the last three or four hundred years. And my approach to that is by copying nature. Nature is clean, green and sustainable and has already solved most of the problems that humans are facing. And uh, so she is the master teacher. And if we can really focus in on the lessons that nature offers us, then we really do have a chance of restoring this Garden of Eden. I first discovered my passion when I was 10 years old. And uh, I grew up beside the Indian Ocean, not far from the beach, so I used to run down to the beach every day after school, and, and I used to wag school a lot as well, whenever I could get away with it. And uh, so, whether it was rough weather or good weather, I was in the water surfing, or if the weather were good, I was, I was snorkeling and uh, watching fish swim and watching everything in nature. I was completely absorbed and obsessed with it. I wasn't interested in any other thing. So, and I was fascinated by movement, how fish swim and how seaweeds change their shape for waves to go past so that the, the waves wouldn't break them off. And, uh, and I noticed over a period of time that there was some commonality in all of these things and how nature makes things go well, how fish swim so effectively. So how did my childhood, how did my background affect um, this thing that's really been my obsession my whole life or my passion? Well, by the time I was four, I'd, I'd lived in every capital city of Australia. So we're on the move the whole time. And in fact, um, until about 10 years ago, I'd never lived more than 18 months in one place in my life. So having that, and I, and I went to so many different schools, I don't even remember the name of half of them. And so I really didn't make friends. But, so I didn't, I, I, I kind of learnt that I didn't need to make friends because I always got to live near wild places. I grew up in the outback and I grew up beside the coast. And so that became my interest. And so I really wasn't interested in anybody else, I was just interested in nature. That was everything to me. And I was totally absorbed in it and totally satisfied by it. And, and there's no conflict for me in nature, whereas, you know, you're interacting with people, there's good times and bad times. Well, in nature it's only good times for me. So. And then I went to boarding school, so with the Jesuit priests. They were kind of an austere bunch and, uh, you know, there's not a lot of camaraderie or friendship. And, so uh, once again, my real interest was in nature and then, I, uh, and then that seeing those shapes through the iconography of the church and, and everything um, that they were presenting as being important, I didn't find any of it important and I wasn't interested. And I, and I had uh, quite acute attention deficit disorder as a kid and um, I really didn't do well in school except in English and history, which I kind of like because of stories. And, but uh, I didn't do well in the other things, so I used to daydream in class. I'd go to the back of the room and I'd just kick back and I, you know, the class would start and I would just start dreaming about how fish swim. And that, that really is the sum total of my entire education. So, and, and it was a classical education that only taught science and math and languages. So there, there was no sort of social science and no uh, art or manual arts or anything like that. So, so I did that myself. I'd go home and I'd look at things in nature. I'd collect things. I'd make things with my hands and, you know, pull things apart. And, and so school disappeared as being important to me. I was not interested. And I lived for my own personal world and developed all sorts of skills because of that, just because I was interested. Not because somebody was teaching me, but because I was interested and I wanted to do that thing. So that included building canoes and dinghies, and I built my first dinghy when I was 10. I built my first, can, uh, first canoe by the time I was 10, and my first dinghy by the time I was 11. So, and then surfboards and all sorts of things like that. So. 
So what is my business today? What am I doing? Well, I spent many years in wilderness areas. I spent many years studying comparative religion and mysticism. And that's shamanic cultures, all of the earliest spiritual pursuits of humanity around the world, religions and uh, meditation. And I noticed that uh, over and over and over and over again, the shapes that I was seeing in nature were, were fundamentally important to all of these religions, but most of these religions had actually lost sight of why they were using these symbols. So it was lost in the past. But I'd already worked out that this whirlpool that we see in the bathtub <clears throat> represents the path of least resistance in our known universe. Is whenever nature has to achieve something, it uses that geometry, always. And there's no exception, which is quite remarkable. In 40 years of studying this, I haven't found a single exception. And so I thought, well, this whirlpool that we see in the bathtub if we could understand that, then we're going to have a key to making better industrial things, maybe saving energy, maybe solving some of the problems that we have, maybe reducing pollution. So it took me a long, 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 long time. But eventually, I had an aha moment. I worked out how to freeze one of these whirlpools. So I froze a whirlpool. And this, actually, is a frozen whirlpool. It says, Imagine just pulling the path, plug out of any bath anywhere in the world. You're going to get exactly the same shape. In the southern hemisphere, it's the other way. And if you froze it, and that's the secret sauce, I don't tell people how I froze it, that's what you end up with. And these shapes are all the streamlines of a whirlpool. Then what I discovered, that's about 20 years ago, what I discovered is every whirlpool, or vortex, or eddy, in our known universe, is built to exactly the same algorithm. It's got the same mathematical construct with four variables. So once you have that reverse engineered, now you can reinvent the entire industrial world. That's everything from turbines to pumps to fans to heat exchanges, because heat travels this way. If you light a candle and you look carefully, you'll see the heat is actually turning off in this direction. So propellers. Uh, the shape of an aircraft or a submarine, anything that you can imagine where you're moving something through gas or liquid or you're moving gas or liquid through something or you've got heat moving through something, which is 99% of everything that humans ever do. If you want to reduce the drag and the friction and the energy that's required to achieve that job, then the simplest thing in the world is to replicate this, because this is what nature uses everywhere, and nature is always much, much, much more efficient. Our human heart is much more efficient than the best pumps humans have ever done. There's not an insect on that, there's not a, a living insect that any scientist on Earth can explain the flight efficiency of. Right? There is no scientist that can explain the swimming efficiency of a single fish, or a tadpole, or anything in nature. Because when you apply the understandings of science and technology and you, you apply the Navier-Stokes equations and uh, the math that people use for solving problems, all of that proves that nature cannot work. And yet nature works just fine, thank you. So we're coming at it from the wrong direction. And the world of science and technology takes the assumption that the shortest distance between this point and this point is a straight line. So therefore, if you want to use the least energy, you need to go in a straight line if you want to get from there to there. That's perfectly reasonable. Well, our entire thinking of the Industrial Revolution, of the modern age, is based on that. And if, yet if you look at the human cardiovascular system, there's 60,000 miles of plumbing, the most efficient plumbing and pump known to man, and there's not a single straight pipe in there. Now, that's remarkable. What does that tell us? It tells us that the straight line thinking is wrong. It's like flat earth thinking. It's wrong. It works to a point, but it's very wasteful. Nature doesn't do it anywhere. Nature uses this geometry. So now, we've reverse engineered it. That's what we're doing. So this company, the PAX group of companies, the seven companies that are doing all sorts of things, from fans to pumps, etc. And we're applying this to everything that we can think of. And typically, 
we can save about a third of the energy of the best devices that humans are building today. Nature saves about two-thirds. We think we know why we're only getting half of nature's benefits, and that's what we're researching. And uh, we have uh, uh, 28 engineers, we have a whole bunch of PhDs and physicists, and we're looking really deeply into this. We're just at the beginning stages of it. My plans for my business is to make it a role model for businesses in design work. So we're creating a very powerful research tank. Uh, we have some very, very clever minds working here. We work with universities across America, with uh, professors and very, very capable engineers. And we're creating math around this. We're creating computer programs and we're proving that these things work. We're building prototypes of all sorts of things. We have uh, a couple of thousand different prototypes now, everything from wind turbines to pumps and heat exchangers and fans, etc., etc. And we test them. We have uh, research boats and we have laboratory equipment and we have six different laboratories. And so we come up with a concept. You know, we hear, oh, air conditioners use far too much energy. All the brownouts in California are caused by air conditioners turning on in the summertime because it's so inefficient. And the world sells half a billion air conditioners and refrigerators a year and they're using vast amounts of energy, polluting. And they're full of uh, gases that when they leak, destroy the ionosphere. So these are, these are problematic things. These are a real challenge to humanity and the environment. So we hear about this and we say, can we build a better refrigerator or air conditioner? That what does nature do? How does nature cool things? Because nature does it really well. We've got a North Pole and a South Pole, really cold. When we perspire, we cool ourselves. Nature's really good at refrigeration. It doesn't use much energy. If you think of a computer, the computer's got heat sinks in it and fans and all sorts of things to try and get rid of the, the, uh, the heat, creating lots of noise while we're doing it. And uh, in a laptop, it's about half of the energy of the laptop is to just try and get rid of that heat. A far, far more powerful computer is the human brain. It has no heat sinks, no fans, never uh, heats up more than two or three degrees in its entire lifetime or you drop dead. So nature's got plenty to teach us. So what we did is we looked at that and we isolated how nature does it. What are the fundamental things happening here? And we're able to reverse engineer those. And now we've designed an air conditioner. At this stage, it looks like it's going to use half the energy. It's going to be half the size, cost half as much to build, and won't use any poisonous gases for the ionosphere. So this is a dramatic shift. And so this is the future of the company. We're designing a wind turbine right now that can be used in third world countries because three quarters of the world's people don't have access to cheap energy and the new wind turbines are too expensive for the third world. So what are they going to do? They can't afford the imported oil, so they can't get energy. If you can't get energy, you can't have a light, you can't do, have a factory, you can't make stuff, you can't use a pump to irrigate your fields. So we have a huge percentage of the population in abject poverty. We need to get them access to clean, cheap energy. Now, a clean, cheap wind turbine is a great solution. So we've designed a turbine that can be made out of bamboo, local products, and uh, scavenged parts out of cars, etc., old wreck cars. And we can create a wind turbine that anybody can use and just done locally with a tiny amount of uh, money and not much effort. So they're the kinds of things that we're really keen on. And we patent these technologies in the industrial world, but we don't patent them in the third world. So that Malawi and Africa or uh, Costa Rica or any countries that are, don't have very strong economies can go out and make these things for their own consumption. So that's, that's the vision of, the, of this company is to, is to show the world that you can actually do it, prove that it can be done, research this concept more and more I think there's a hundred years of research to be done on this. It's pretty complex. And then hand that off to the industrial world so that the world can shift. And then the other thing is uh, as much education as we can put out there. It influence as many people as possible. How do I share that with the world? For me, the easiest, simplest, best, most satisfying way is with young people. 
Because as we get older, we tend to get a little crystallized. When we're young, we'll try anything. When we get a little older, we'll try less. When we get into our middle ages, we're probably not going to try very much at all. We just want to play safe and get ready for retirement. And so, even when I started these companies, and I went out to the world of engineers, I found such resistance from the most clever people out there that were very focused on the way they were doing things already, that I then went to the colleges and I grabbed kids straight out of college that had no fixed ideas, that were actually open to possibility because they didn't know enough not to be. And, and I think I discovered this stuff because I didn't have the burden of knowledge. I didn't know anything about engineering, so I just saw what nature did without trying to say it can't work. And, and so I love talking to children because they have fun with it. And there isn't a no. They're not fighting it. They're just, wow, isn't this great? And so that's a pleasure because it's so easy. And when you influence children in this way, you're setting something up for the rest of their lives. They've, they've opened the door to that possibility. That never closes again. Once you've opened it, it can't close. It's in there. And so different things will happen to them in their lives and they'll see things and evidence that remind them of this. I've met kids that, or people now, that saw uh, Donald in Mac Math Magic Land in the 60s. And those people are receptive to this. They saw it when they were children and they're receptive to this now, even if they're in their 50s. And people that didn't see that are nowhere near as receptive. So. If you can talk to kids and you can get them excited, that really is the future. And these things are generational. You know, the world doesn't change overnight. In fact, uh, the last person that really looked at this subject that I've found was Leonardo da Vinci 500 years ago. And it's taken 500 years to get to now when it's actually starting to be a reality. Now, I don't want to wait 500 years for the next lot. We're fortunately in the age of it, the internet, and uh, we've got access to kids. So I want this to be happening as fast as possible. And I think the speed at which it can happen is this generation. These kids today, in another 10, 20 years, are going to be reinventing the world using these approaches. I, I have a lot of interests outside of work, but they're all kind of fused together because I don't see work as work. I see it. Uh, I'm just living my life, and work is a product of me living my life. So often in the shower I'm thinking about how things move, and uh, or how to solve a problem that some person's got in some factory in India, or anything. What I do whenever I hear of a problem, I think, how does nature do that? It's really easy. There's this massive library out there called nature, and, and I only know a bit of it, because there's far too much of it for an individual to know it all. But I think, from what I know, how does nature solve that problem? And it's a real blast. You know, somebody was talking to me the other day about the need for um, better resins for plywood that don't outgas. And I know a resin that I, I found years ago and I thought it'd be great for mending bones. When you heat it, it's totally soft and it's sticky as you can. You can't even imagine how sticky this stuff is. And when it dries, it becomes completely crystallized, incredibly strong, and no outgassing uh, when, it, uh, when it gets to room temperature. So it has to be really hot in order to be used, but then it's totally stable. So, I mean, just even thinking of things like that, you know, there's a, there's a wild, um, plant that's been released into the rainforests in Northern Australia, for instance. It's overtaking everything. It's lantana. It was brought in to be put in people's gardens and it's just taking over the rainforest, causing a huge amount of damage. Well, I was walking through the rainforest, I spent a lot of time there, and I noticed that there were little patches where the stuff doesn't grow. So I looked at why that was and it happened to be a particular species of wild Australian ginger is growing in each of those places. And so there's something in that wild ginger that stops lantana growth. So there's a great solution. So I offered that to the state government to do research on, to synthesize, 
to do as a spray, because obviously it's not hurting other things in the rainforest, this ginger, it's natural to the environment. So there's a great opportunity. I love doing that. So, um, but I love building things, you know, houses, designing. I've designed all sorts of houses and boats. I'm a boat builder. I sail boats. I make, but I, I have 13 boats at the moment. It's, you know, kind of, it's an addiction, I guess. My smallest one is eight feet long and the longest one is 150 feet long. It's a research boat. So anything to do with anything, really, it's, it's all fun. Collecting driftwood, whatever, you know. Rocks, it's all fa fabulous. If money were no object and I could do anything I wanted to do on this earth, I, I've thought about this, actually. Uh, I w first of all, I would, um, I would definitely put a huge amount of research into energy production that could democratize energy for all peoples on earth. Because the difference between the wealthy and the non-wealthy is energy. All of the wealth of the 20th and 21st century that's concentrated in the West has been built on the back of energy. Started off with slaves, or uh, animals, then slaves, then coal, and then oil and gas, nuclear. But that's what's created the wealth, right? And at least three quarters of the world has, has no ability to get there. When you think of our universe, it is made of energy. In fact, Einstein calls matter frozen energy. So. Everything exists of energy. Physicists and mystics alike say that nothing exists except energy. So the universe is full of energy. It's made of energy. That's all there is. Vast, vast, vast amounts. And the universe does not run on fossil fuels. It doesn't run on nuclear fuels. It doesn't even run on sunlight. So physicists will tell us today that only they only understand 4% of the energy on, in our universe. 96% of it is called dark energy. They have no idea what that is. Right? But it's there, and it's most of everything. So we need to be looking at that. Because if we can, can we work out what it is that the universe is working with and running on? If we can do that, then we, we can get over this energy problem. Nature doesn't experience an energy shortage. Never has and never will. There is no shortage at all. It's just that we're using the wrong thing. We're using fossilized sunlight, sunlight which is fossil fuels. Or we're using weather patterns from sunlight. But then there's this 96% that is there all the time. So I would certainly be funding a lot of research into that subject. And I've got a heap of ideas about it already because it all comes down to this, in my opinion. And uh, I'm publishing a book next year that is actually addressing this. So, so that's number one. And number two, I would probably go around the third world and buy all the foreign debt in exchange for all the wilderness areas so that all of the wilderness areas of the earth could come under one body of management so that we could start to mitigate the destruction of wild areas because our wild areas are the most valuable resource we've got. And if we destroy them, we can never get them back again. We've lost 25% of all the species on Earth in the last 50 years. Every species we lose is a tragedy because it is a complete library of information. We have no idea what that species could have told us, what we could have copied, or what we could have used that's clean, green, and sustainable to build a better wor world for everybody. We can't afford to lose a single species. It's a tragedy. So if I had unlimited resources, I would be putting a huge effort into protecting wild spaces. Thanks for watching this episode of Business with Passion. If you'd like more information about Jay Harmon, other shows, or to perhaps to be a guest on a future show, go online to tv.manygoodideas.com.